All right, so a little after six, so why don't we call the meeting to order. Um, are there any requests to add or add anything to the agenda? All right, hearing none. Uh, is there, are there members of the public present? I do not see any members of the public. Okay. Um, is there anything on the consent agenda that folks would like to remove for discussion? All right, uh, hearing none. So again, a reminder that we don't vote on the consent agenda. Um, it's essentially adopted um, without the need to vote on it. Um, so Sarah, I believe the next topic is uh, COVID response information and updates. Yep, so uh, we had a request for some financial uh, updates for um, what's going on with COVID and just general operations updates as well. So we can provide that. I've got um, Josh Tyler on the line as well. And I believe Josh SD is also here. So if you have in your packet some um, quick numbers that uh, Nola put together for the financials um, year to date as far as, um, sorry, as far as the expenses that we've incurred due to COVID. Um, and you can see those, again, that's item number four. And uh, we, as I mentioned in my um, executive director update, we were informed that we were not eligible for one um, pool of money that the state had available. We are still um, submitting, gathering our documents and submitting to, for the ELGER, the local government expense reimbursement. And we'll be collecting those documents through the end of the calendar year. Um, so we expect that we will be able to receive some reimbursement for um, those majority of those COVID expenses. We had already uh, let them know what we had anticipated our expenses would be. And they, um, the entity that is uh, organizing that grant um, has indicated that that fell well within um, their, um, their program. So that is the, the financials as far as operations. Um, we are, uh, all of our, our drop-off centers, all of our facilities are open um, with the exception of the admin office as far as to the public. So we do have uh, every drop-off center is operational, um, the depot, the MRF, um, and the ODF. So um, we are updating our um, emergency closure plan for what we anticipate this, this um, next wave that we are feeling that we're in the midst of. Um, so we are working on that um, this week and we can, um, we're looking to try to again, as much as we can keep folks uh, in one spot it's a little bit more difficult with the drop-off centers because we do have employees there who um, kind of float in and out of Williston. We have more than the, our quote, normal pre-COVID staffing at Williston, um, just due to the amount of traffic that's coming through there and the materials that are managed and being handled. Um, and because we have uh, reduced some of the days and the hours at the other drop-off centers. So we are cycling more employees through Williston um, but where we can um, keep folks to their kind of their home base, we will to uh, minimize any uh, additional insular exposure. We have, we are still you know, obviously uh, requiring all of our employees to follow all of the this COVID procedures that we've had in place since late March. All employees are required to wear masks. They are um, required to wipe down their surfaces throughout the day. Um, where it is possible to not share equipment, they don't share equipment. Um, they have to maintain uh, a minimum of six feet of distance between themselves and any other person. Um, we do have the plexiglass shields up in place at our drop-off centers. So all of those precautions continue to be in place and are being enforced. Josh, I don't know if you had other kind of operational updates um, that you'd like to provide. One of the things we identified as a potential uh, risk was uh, when it gets really cold, where people were going to get warm at. So one of the things we did, especially at uh, Williston, because it's our largest site, is we actually bought a six by six a little tiny warming hut 
Um, we moved it to the farthest uh, management area of the facility, uh, which we needed anyway, because that keeps a position or keeps a person in that position to help manage uh, material as it comes in, but it also gives them a place to get out of the cold when they can. Um, we've repurposed a couple other structures as well so that we can minimize the amount of time people will be, you know, exchanging in and out of the booth for the most part. So that was one thing we identified. One of the good things that works for us is that by nature, our, our business is outside, you know, for operators. So that's working in our favor. Um, you know, a lot of the most current wave of COVID cases is coming from, you know, residential backyard gatherings. So, you know, as far as um, workplace COVID um, increases, it's not really taking place. You know, people kind of know how to handle themselves at work. So that's one of the things that we're really reinforcing right now with our staff is to follow the procedures we have in place, um, be very diligent, you know, so that you can say with a straight face that you were six feet away from somebody at all times and that you followed our protocols. Um, so that's really kind of how we're focusing with our, you know, our staff and our operators right now. Mm -hmm. And we've gone back to the per bag pricing at the DOCs as well, um, away from the flat fee. And we're taking nearly all of the materials that we did before. There's still a few that we are still struggling to accept, like hardcover books um, is still one of those items that is remains to be tricky for us to take at this time for a variety of reasons. Josh, there are one or two other items that are a little, little sticky. But by and large, most of the material that people were used to being able to drop off um, at the DOCs, they, they can. Um, so our traffic uh, continues to be steady um, at each of our sites. Um, and um, I'd be happy to answer other COVID-related questions if we haven't hit on them so far. Um, I did mention in my update that we will be, as far as the administrative office, uh, we are keeping that office closed we simply don't have adequate uh, air exchange in that office building to be able to house the 20 to 22 bodies um, that we normally do on a daily basis. So uh, we will be, those who can work remotely are gonna to continue to work remotely through at least March. Uh, we'll be looking at the situation at the beginning of March and reassessing the needs there as well. Um, people are in the building, um, so the finance department is regularly uh, on site, as is operations, and um, they are still abiding by the protocol of, you know, you know to, your, to your corners um, and making sure that um, they check in, that they take the temperature, that they are you know, doing the contact tracing, um, and um, that, yeah, again, things are wiped down as people are leaving and, um, and just following, again, those best practices protocols. So, but again, most of our folks who, again, who can work from home will be through the very early to mid spring. Questions from commissioners? Sarah, did you say that you're like preparing plans for the potential for closure or that you're expecting closure? We're up, we're updating our, our plans. So just in, in case, you know, we don't want to have to if we, don't, if we don't have to shut everything down again like we did, we don't want to. But we need to be able to kind of put um, on paper the if then. So we had some draft plans back in the summertime in, in anticipation of um, the potential for this. So we just want to be prepared so we can get that out to our staff, get that out to the board to say, if this happens, here's our process and here's how it will, what it will look like. Um, so we're not necessarily anticipating that. We, we actually don't want to, <laughs> um, but it really is if there's an outbreak or something. You know, something to Josh's like point, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to hit to, to create closures in essential businesses. So yeah. And again, that's a good point. We just, for the newer members of the board, we are considered an essential service. So we really don't want to have to close down any of our facilities. Um, but in the event we do, like we had to in the spring where we had between eight and 10 people needing to quarantine at one time, that was pretty devastating. I think our main area of vulnerability is with our roll-off crew. Um, as with everyone in the country, drivers with CDL licenses are few and far between and are getting fewer and far between. Um, and we are very sensitive to 
um, the availability of, of our crew. So um, we are looking at the possibility of hiring another driver. Uh, we do need additional maintenance, maintenance support. Um, so as much as we can bring another person on sooner rather than later, we want to do that. So that's actually something we'll be um, coming back to you next with next month because it's not in the budget. So we are now crunching our, our, um, our personnel budget now to see if we have space in the existing budget to be able to add a person for the beginning of the year because that, that really is our main area of, uh, like I said, of vulnerability. And, and just, we do have uh, backups with local haulers who have CDL licenses, but if we lose our roll off staff, you know, what we accept will change. Um, you know, to more of a basic model. So it's, you know, how we are affected and, and what type of employees infected, infected affected um, will uh, kind of be dependent on how we respond. Right. And that'll, that's all kind of part of that, um, yep. that review document. Other questions? Um, I have a question about the credit cards. Is it possible to speed up that process at all? Yep, so uh, we have a call into our credit card um, uh, merchant, uh, merchant person um, and I'm just waiting for a call back. So that is in line for Williston and then Richmond um, and then John needs to probably step in or Nola can fill in on what the, um, the needs would be for rolling others out and how quickly we can do that. But certainly by the end of this calendar year, we'll have those two up uh, and available. Um, so then I'm not sure if Nola or John. Yes. Yeah. John, go ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll be ready to roll with uh, Milton and South Burlington fairly soon. Uh, Essex is the one that has a little more complicated situation, but we're, we're looking into that and hopefully tackle it soon as well. I don't think we'll be able to get away from cash, um, but we're uh, less concerned about physical coins and, and paper dollars now, but we've, we've long wanted to put in a credit card convenience. So it's a good time as of any, um, and so we will be putting those in and, and that will, I think, help um, if there's any lingering concerns of our, of our customers, that will help with that as well. Other questions? Um, I am curious, kind of teeing off Ken's question uh, just before the meeting. Is it is um, it possible to do a virtual tour for uh, commissioners of any of the facilities or spaces. Um, I, I know that there was a connectivity issue with, uh, with um, the compost facility, but I, I'm curious if there's any other opportunities that we could offer. Sure, I think the connectivity was with a Facebook Live, so having it be a live version, but we can certainly just tape a walkthrough. That's, mm -hmm. that's easy to do, yep. Um, if, yeah, if there's some maybe dates or something that we could uh, explore in the, in the next month and a half or, or so. And we it can sounds even, like there's some interest in that. Yeah, we could tape, um, tape a walk, tape a walk through and then post that to our YouTube channel um, just for sure. everyone to see. Um, and we can send out a link when those are available. You know, I'm, uh, I've not been to the Heinsberg, the new Heinsberg drop-off center. That's one that's of, of particular interest. I know they're only open on Saturdays. Um, so I'm kind of reluctant to go on a Saturday if it's going to be busy, but I would like to see a, a walkthrough of the Heinsberg operation. Great idea. And yeah, Heinsberg isn't too busy in the mornings. That's actually the one I visit frequently. So if you did want to go and take a look, it's cost of admission is roughly $2 for a, for a small bag. <laughs> So, um, but it's it's no longer no more than uh, my experience is no more than a two minute wait. So it's it's got it, or this is before noon, just as an FYI. Thanks, Josh. Other questions? All right, I think we can move to the next agenda item. 
Great. So let's see, let's see what's going on here. So the next agenda item is um, the a revised lease agreement for the town of Richmond. And um, Richmond's DOC lease agreement ends on December 31. And uh, when I uh, attended the um, select board meeting last month, the select board had requested instead of a standard five-year extension that they were interested in a one-year extension. And they want to talk with us further about um, the conditions of the lease. And I think, you know, given the, um, the back and forth with the town over a variety of issues and their desire to you know, kind of work with us on improving um, the experience for the residents at the location and our, our desire to improve elevation in general, knowing that it kind of goes beyond just internal um, you know, repaving and things like that. We're talking about potentially a road, a, a new road and some pretty decent uh, capital investments in that facility. Um, I thought it was, it was certainly reasonable to bring a one-year extension to the board. And I know Logan was, on, was at that uh, select board meeting as well. Um, and they uh, brought the red line strikeout version that you have in your packet to the select board. I think it was this past Monday, Logan. And there were some questions about uh, one of the uh, strikeouts. So on, if you're looking at the red line strikeout document in the packet, if you go down to page, I believe it's two. Um, so section six, letter E, they had a concern with um, the language I added where it says, uh, the drop-off center will be open to district residents, not more than three days per week uh, throughout the year. And I added not more than three days per week to essentially reflect that right now we are open two days a week due to staffing concerns and ability to uh, move materials in and out due to the roll-off driver uh, concern. So the town came back with some suggested language um, that would essentially requ require us to be open the three days, but for, um, unless we get approval from the town manager. So they just recently, um, not too long ago, sent some language for our consideration that um, I can either read, Bryn, or I can share my screen and show. I think it's okay if you read it. Okay. So the suggested um, revision, it says, the drop-off center will be open to district residents three days per week throughout the year, period. The hours and days of operation may be modified by the district after consultation with Richmond's town manager, period. The scheduled days and hours shall be as follows, and then they would, we would fill in the blank. Any changes to this schedule will be posted on the Richmond Front Porch Forum. So I, I also want to recognize that there's some folks that are visual learners. So if there's, if it would be beneficial yeah. to see it, then I can I can copy this into the chat box if that's comfortable for some folks. Unless you want to screen share it again. Um, that would be good. Thank you. Are there any other leases where we have hours of operation listed? That's a good question, Josh. I think, I think Milton does because when we were closing things down, um, uh, and we needed to look at, and then reopening things. We needed to look at, you know, what the days were were at Milton, and their language is very similar. It just says if there is a days of operation, um, we just need to confirm with the town manager. So it's it's not unsimilar to that, um, and I'm pretty sure that lease does call out the days that we are open. And I believe the Williston. Um, host town agreement also specifies the days being six days a week that we should have um, a facility open in Williston. Hey, Jonathan, could you allow me to share my screen, please? Or open up the chat box for us? Oh, I wonder if a webinar, oh yeah, into a webinar. Yep, I've got it set now. I believe you can share your screen. Yes. Yeah. 
I share everything. <laughs> That's not true. Excellent. And Sarah, just check me to make sure this is the most recent copy from, from our town manager. This looks good. Okay. So the new lease would run from January 1, uh, 2021 through December 31, 2021. Sarah, did I hear you correctly? And you said that it's only open two days a week now? Correct. It's only open two days a week currently. Um, Pre-COVID was three days. So do you have any concerns about signing a lease that says you agreed to be open for three days, knowing that you're clearly not now? So I would um, also be sending in the, the request and, uh, and that was one of the concerns with the back and forth that I did have with the town manager today was, um, you know, if we didn't, if it was required that we be open and we couldn't, we just couldn't do it. What are the repercussions uh, to the district? And this is where he came back with this language to say that, uh, to make it a little softer in that allowing that the, uh, the hours and days of operation would be modified um, after consultation with the town manager. Originally, they wanted, had in there um, that we could only modify with the approval of the select board. And Prior to that, it was, they had force majeure language in there. So this is definitely um, a much more, uh, I think, you know, a reasonable approach given that, you know, force majeure is, that's a big deal. Um, and if we had to wait for the next select board meeting, say they had one on a Monday and like today on a Wednesday, we needed to close tomorrow, <laughs> they would have to have an emergency meeting. We, you know, it just it wouldn't work. So, with this, I can um, text or call Josh Aronson and say, here's the situation. We, and I would copy Logan, um, we need to close the DOC tomorrow for X reason. He's, he's a very reasonable person and I don't anticipate that, you know, he would say no, because we, we don't take this lightly. We want to be open. <laughs> it's not that we want to close our facilities. So this, this is definitely um, a good compromise that came from a bunch of flurries of emails this afternoon. So I feel comfortable. Should there be Maybe something in there about holidays during the week? I mean, if they're gonna get this specific, I think we need to protect ourselves with respect to, you know, if a holiday is on a Wednesday and that's one of the days that we can, so that terminology or verbiage ought to be in there in my opinion. Okay. Also, if it's open on the weekends too, it can be hard to reach people. So if you have to consult somebody and you also can't open, then that might be difficult. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, what I would need to request. And I'm not sure if it needs to be in the lease document, but I would just need to have Josh's cell phone and the ability to reach him at any time. Um, sure. Do we have anything in the, um, what about weather? If it, we have a 24 inches of snow overnight, probably not open it tomorrow. Right, and that was what they think they were thinking was a force majeure, but that's not really, you know, 12 inches of snow is not a force majeure. Um, Sarah, um, maybe it's worth reiterating what their greatest interest was. Well, I mean- What's our greatest interest? <laughs> Sorry, what was that? What was our greatest interest? So from what I saw in the emails, the select board members uh, they wanted to prioritize ensuring that it wasn't the the language of not more than alluded to the fact of not more than three days alluded to saying that there would be a higher frequency of less than three days. And so by removing that language, it, it took away some of the concern and that, you know, the district's interest is to be open at least three days as much as possible. Um, and not less than that. So it, it, I think it was an attempt, some of the wordsmithing was an attempt to say, under most conditions, we will be open three days a week, barring uh, unavoidable, uncontrollable, unforeseen circumstances, in which case the district will contact the town manager and coordinate a response and notification to townspeople. 
that's what I got out of the email exchange. Yeah, this is John Gifford. I, I like that, Vern, because I'm, I'm the town treasurer. So people come into the office all, when we closed down, when, when the, the collection place closed down, there was a ton of folks coming into the office complaining about our call and complaining about it being closed as if we could, the town could reopen it. So from the town's point of view, um, th that stability is an important element. So I think, but I think it's important to say, you know, as much as we possibly, what, what, as much as, it, as it's within our power, we're gonna be open three days a week um, mm -hmm. and, and let, them, let them know that that's our intent. That's what we wanna do. Um, and, and if COVID comes up and we can't do it, then that's not within our power. But uh, citizens in town were pretty irate that the place wasn't open. I say that from my point of view as town treasurer when people were coming to call in the office routinely. And I did communicate exactly that to, um, to Josh when they brought this originally to um, the select board meeting up um, two weeks ago. So there was another email that said, it, it is absolutely our intent to reopen three days as, as soon as we can. Um, this is temporary due to COVID. So I had uh, listed that in my correspondence with him, but um, we didn't get that into the lease. And it, it seemed it's, it's, you know, just too much to put into the lease, like that specificity. Um, and and Sarah, it, Sarah doesn't say that the town manager has to approve it it just says you have to consult with them right so you're going to do what you need to do right hey sarah this is tim i guess uh three concerns the first um it doesn't say that it's our intent to be open three days it says we will be which sort of implies an obligation and i think that that's sticky language then this other this other word of consult you know i there's this other a uh, minor disagreement going on at the national level about what some words mean, for example, the word ascertainment, right, to go ahead and uh, uh, give access to GSI offices to the potential president-elect, depending on what side of the political spectrum <laughs> you're on. Um, and so this consultation imply, you know, there's a big difference between consultation and notification. Um, so I would just argue that this basically, for, for me, it opens up a, a bit of a can of worms saying that the town of Richmond has the right to go ahead and, and mandate when we're going to be open and approve any decision that we do otherwise. And I guess the other one is not specific to the language, but just in general. I think we're really, I don't understand why we're wordsmithing individual leases with towns. These should be boilerplate, very standard. And if the town doesn't like it and they don't want to renew it, then we should go ahead and not renew it, you know. And I, I say that representative of a town that doesn't have the benefit of a drop-off center. So, um, you know, we're this costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of board time, it takes legal time to review. You know, this isn't free, um, and I don't think we should get wrapped around the axle. I don't think we should ram it down the host town's throats, necessarily speaking. But I don't think we should. Uh, I think we should be very direct and not have a lot of flexibility. Well, then I don't know if you had any feedback, um, additional feedback from conversations within the town or with the manager or select board. Only, only to share that I think the the town has been very pleased with the um, responsiveness, especially in light of the last couple of years of interactions with CSWD in the process of coming to this language, and um, it, it has both like symbolic value that um, that. Sarah and the town manager and the select board have been able to like spend spend that time to Tim's point um, and and some of that capital uh, to to say we're, we're really serious about working together and we're going to find a way to to make this work and to sort of repair some relations and make sure that there's a sort of mutual beneficence in, in terms of like what this does to tee up further sort of town district um, relations so but Logan, we're, not, we're not working together we are a member of a district this is a collaboration that working together implies that it's an adversarial relationship and if and? that's been set up and interpreted in any way i'm not sure why but that i think that needs to be put to bed i also so want to just I don't give know some that, frame of reference yeah. so this is just a one-year extension 
which gives us opportunity to kind of revisit this in a year. So just to also keep that in mind. I think the the option, um, the, the alternative was for the town to not um, renew. So if the town did um, decide to not renew the lease or, or uh, approve the five-year extension, then we would have needed to have notified the town that we would be um, vacating the site and we would have had to have begun decommissioning the drop-off center at Richmond, which is certainly an option for the district, but I don't think we want to do that. And, and along those lines, I don't think it's the town and the current select board's intention to pursue that either. They want to find a way to like work this out and um, and remain um, engaged in this municipality. Sarah, what do you need from us right now? Um, what I would need would be uh, approval, uh, actually, and I think if everyone's all set with um, this language, Logan can release the, the screen share. Um, we would, I would need the authorization to sign on behalf of the district to renew um, the, to renew the lease for a one year term, um, given the language. Uh, do we have proposed language for adoption? Heat up? Um, sorry? Um, no, I did not prepare a resolution, but the resolution would be to um, authorize the executive director to um, sign a one year lease with the town of Richmond for use of the um, drop off center property located in that town. So moved. I'll second that. All in favor? What? I'm sorry, uh, discussion? Sorry. For, with what language? What are we, are the strikeout, our strikeout version, or with adopting uh, Richmond's proposed modification? The strikeout version with the proposed modifications. Thank you, Tim. One question on that. Uh, who will be responsible for putting notices in front porch forum? The town or, or the district? The district. Which we, we would do anyway. Um, so we don't normally, um, actually Michelle is on here somewhere too. Um, when we have regular either um, known closures or anticipated closures, we uh, will post those obviously on our website. Um, we don't always post uh, emergency closures to Front Porch Forum because there's sometimes a delay anyway. Um, it doesn't always appear the next day or certainly doesn't appear the same day. Um, but we would, depending on the type of closure, and I think, uh, you know, to the point here about weather, you know, I will, um, I can certainly see clarification with Josh that he's not talking about, you know, 12 foot, 18 foot snowstorm that it's more uh, along the lines of a COVID closure or something that is more longer term um, versus something that everyone's going to say, oh yeah, of course, you're gonna be closed. It's 24 inches of snow, but I can clarify that. And Sarah, I believe we're also doing sending push notifications for facility closures through uh, a new app service. Is that right? We have a, people can sign up for text alerts. Um, okay. So we can, um, certainly do another push on that availability and let sure people know um, that that is a service that we do provide. So yes. Okay. Is there further discussion? All right. I'm gonna request the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? Any, uh, anyone object? I object. Okay, motion passes. Okay. We can move to the next topic, Sarah. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> 
So the next item um, that we have up is a uh, review of the um, capital projects. And so Josh Tyler is here. And uh, we did this review with the Finance Committee a couple of weeks ago. And what we wanted to do was just to, ahead of the budget season and, and um, budget work, to talk about the projects that we have um, going on right now, the ones we anticipate being able to move forward with this, um, this year, the ones that we are thinking are probably on the fence for not moving forward and need to be pushed to the next year, um, and then things that we may have kind of coming up in the next year to two years to three years. So we did include in the packet um, the draft minutes of the Finance Committee, where there's a lot of detail in those minutes about the conversation that that committee had, um, you know, for reference. So, um, Josh, if you kind of want to lead this group through that, um, feel, do feel free to be looking back at those, um, those draft minutes of the Finance Committee for additional details as Josh is walking through. And if it makes sense, Brim, would you like me to share my screen? Yes, please. Okay, so I will share. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, just this is our three year outlook for capital. We're starting at the MRF. Um, one of the things I'll preface this with, which was brought from the uh, um, Finance Committee, we are working on a timeline and again, you know, just, just an overall package to bring to the board and the Finance Committee on um, what our MRF is going to look like. Um, you know, before COVID hit, we were moving forward um, with, you know, citing a new MRF. We were going to bring uh, some more numbers, more refined thoughts back to you. Um, we've kind of pushed that off for six to 12 months, um, just so that you know that. Um, in FY23, we see a significant amount of capital investment into our existing MRF. And that is there because a lot of the infrastructure that we have is over 30 years old. So um, at FY23, that was a pertinent time to really start, if we weren't gonna move out of the MRF, really start taking a hard look at what needs to be reconditioned, replaced. Um, so that's, when you look at that far right column and you know, that $724,000, that's really what that is. In the event we don't construct a new MRF or are not in the process of constructing a new MRF, if we wanna get another 10, years out of our existing facility, we're gonna to have to start really making some investments. So that's that's what that is. Um, but walking you through um, buildings and repairs, you know, um, our tip floor is old and has holes. So we, we constantly um, spot repair it. Um, we are going to purchase a new loader this year for the MRF, uh, that's part of our contract. Um, it's a, a seven year replacement. The existing loader has 20,000 hours, which is an exorbitant amount of hours for a loader. Um, that is actually currently in the process of being bid right now. Um, so this fiscal year, we're looking at $256,500. And um, as we get to the bottom of this whole capital uh, projection, um, the MRF is the one facility that through its tip fees uh, and sale of material, it covers its own expenses for capital. So we have slotted in our budget this year to put aside, you know, to make sure that we have that $256,500. Um, so that's what that'll, that's what that means when we get to the bottom. Um, Sarah, could you scroll down? Or is there any questions on the MRF? Hearing none, I'll move down. Um, we'll jump into the next. Next program, which is the Organics Diversion Facility. And as we brought to you last month, we are currently amidst a construction project. We got a very favorable um, bid um, from a contractor to construct our site. Um, we are hoping to stay under budget. We're looking that we are gonna stay under budget. Um, but general, you know, this year is a heavy Organics Diversion Facility investment year for a rolling stock as well as the construction project. Um, we're looking at about a million dollars, and that is including the uh, $348,000 we will get reimbursed by the state through a $500,000 grant. It's a 60-40 split. Um, we will be looking to replace uh, one of the older loaders with a brand new loader. 
Um, we are looking to purchase a dump truck. That 120,000 we set aside for the dump truck, we will be coming to the full board because it is over $100,000 for a purchase. We have identified that we may be spending more than that for a more um, a, a piece of equipment that, that fits the needs better. Um, we're looking at a larger rock truck, it would be used. So just, you know, as far as giving you guys an idea of what's coming down the road, um, that is something we will bring back to you that probably won't be the $120,000. Um, and again, as I said, we're on track with our construction project. It's looking to be completed probably by the end of December, but um, all our site visits and all of our, um, all of our interactions with our contractor have been great. And so we are full steam ahead with that. It's, we're really excited to get that going. One of the integral parts of that expansion project is to get that new loader, that new larger loader, and to get uh, a haul truck. So that's where we bring in the haul truck purchase amount to you hopefully by December, maybe January. Um, so just wanted to get the board aware of that. Josh, that was what we discussed at the last board meeting? Yes. Okay. Um, landfill, uh, if you can see down there, it says closed LF. That's the, our closed landfill that we managed. Um, there has been uh, concerns with PFOS or PFAS. Um, those are uh, chemical of emerging concern coming out of, or that have affected drinking water sources. Um, landfills have been identified as a potential source. Um, the state took a very, uh, I think, um, uh, a very, a really good approach. They are monitoring, you know, um, right now. So we are currently in a five-year monitoring process. So that's a residual from last year because we weren't sure where where that PFOS kind of mitigation was gonna fall. So we, we have an eye on that, but we do have it in the budget uh, for FY22 um, for $220,000. Um, our closed landfill is also about six years away from our 30 year closure plan. So when you close, it depended on where, the year you close it, we fell within a, a closure plan of 30 years for post-closure care. Um, after that 30 years, you go into what's called custodial care. That's when you monitor to make sure nothing bad is happening, but that has a, uh, significantly reduced fi uh, financial requirement. And so as we get closer to that, one of the things we're putting in there is that um, our liner, we wanna just identify that our liner is totally intact and, and um, make sure that it's it's good for, for moving on forward. So we've got that in FY23 for $100,000. <coughs> Those are the two expenses there. And Josh, on the 220, that may or may not be needed. We don't know yet. The two hundred twenty thousand. Right. Yeah, we that that's that's not a yeah that's we have it there in case you know we get the letter that says you have to do something now, and so we can go to the board. I mean, it's still over hundred thousand dollars, so you'll see whatever it is we wind up doing. Um, but I don't anticipate at this point that that will be spent in FY twenty two, because again we're in we're in a five year monitoring period. I think we've got three years left of our monitoring period. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there's going to be a lot more research available and um, see what, you know, the effects of these low residual amounts of PFOS are um, in, in our, in, it's out of our leachate. Are we recycling leachate, Josh? No. No, it goes to the uh, Essex uh, wastewater treatment plant. All are of the leachate that comes out of the system? Yes. Are we still generating electricity off off the gas? Mm, honest answer is not really. Um, the operator has not been consistent with keeping that facility online. <laughs> Contract runs out uh, uh, December of 21. Um, and at that point, what was signed for the completion and term of that contract is that we would take control of the building and the, we would pretty much terminate that service. So um, that's uh, moving forward the plan right now. Um, understand the, the amount of gas is going down. Yeah. So I don't, I don't blame the operator for not, you know, taking a ton of time in because there's just not a lot of gas left there. We do have three flares on site that are up and running. We manage those on a monthly basis. And those are all working. Then you gas that does get generated, we burn off. 
Um, if there's no more closed landfills, roll off and maintenance. Um, this is something we 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 kind of knocked this part down or this particular uh, program's uh, capital budget down due to COVID expenses. Um, so the big big ticket items are um, we are looking to purchase a new uh, a, a rack truck. That's our, our utility truck that we use throughout the district. Um, we will get a good resale value on the one that we have that's slotted for $55,000. If we start seeing significant financial hits due to COVID, that's one thing that we can you know, postpone. We can push that off. Um, I don't anticipate us going out to bid for that for a couple more months. That's something I kind of want to wait and see where we wind up with this latest wave of COVID and what our inputs are as far as you know, trash and recycling go. Um, our mini loader. So one of the things I'm looking at doing, oh, sorry, it's a load, MRF loader. Um, our South Burlington facility could use a loader um, so that we don't have to drive from Williston to South Burlington. It also gives us the ability to manage material uh, real time on site. So if um, open top containers, 40 yard containers get full, we can smash it down with our own piece of equipment. So I'm looking at, um, as I said, for the MRF, we're going to replace that piece of equipment. I'm looking at hanging on to it. Because it has 20,000 hours, its resale value is pretty low. But instead of, you know, instead of a 60-hour work week, if we kept it at South Burlington, um, it would have a three to four-hour work week. So the refurbishing is just to go through it, make sure it works, and we can get 10, 15 years out of it. We've done that before. Um, we've got a Volvo from the original transfer station from 1992 that's up in Milton right now. Um, and really, it's just to keep our existing loaders off the road. It's a waste of gas to drive them any significant amount of distance and, in all honesty, operator time. Um, so that's one of the things we're moving forward towards is trying to get that loader into South Burlington. And that's what that 35000 is. Um, the other is pretty basic. Uh, we're getting a new trailer. Uh, we just we haul larger pieces of equipment when we need to rent them. Um, so that's what that trailer is. We've actually already purchased that trailer um, because the old one was 14 years old and needed to be replaced. So that's the bulk of maintenance and roll off. One of the bigger ticket items just in the three year projection is we will be purchasing a new roll off truck next year. Um, and those are pretty integral. Um, we had two for multiple years. We kept one instead of training it, trading it in as a spare. And that is actually We've seen the fruits of that decision because when trucks need to be repaired, we don't we don't go down to one truck. Um, it also gives us the flexibility if we're seeing, um, say, we 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 contract with specific materials to manage from outside haulers, if they are getting too expensive or if their scheduling doesn't work with ours, which has happened, that happened with metal. Um, that third truck gives us the flexibility to take on managing certain materials, which actually is economically favorable to us. So um, that replacement is uh, in FY22 is for our, our second oldest truck. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's roll off and maintenance. Drop off centers. So um, we do need to replace uh, a few compactors, um, Essex specifically. Um, the recycling compactor is pretty beat up. Um, recycling in general, with all the glass that goes through, glass is pretty abrasive. It, 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 um, it shortened, it just, it takes a lot more life out of um, the compactor. So we are looking to do two things with Essex. Uh, we are looking to um, get a, a larger mouth, or so a larger opening compactor. One of the things we've identified is that we have two yard compactors for all of our sites except for Williston. We went with the larger four yarders. And what that does for us is that we saw that it works out really well for um, our uh, recycling compactors that they don't bridge. So it doesn't cause an operational nightmare that you get, you know, a large, you know, refrigerator box stuck in it. And then all of a sudden your recycling compactor goes down. So um, one of the things we're adopting is to move forward with buying purchasing four yard compactors for um, recycling. The two yarders still can handle um, MSW. So that's gonna happen. One of the things on here, uh, we were looking at doing a full re a grind and repave of the Richmond DOC. Um, we're gonna hold off on that. One of the things we identified um, through installing Heinsberg um, and using that as kind of a, our newer model um, is that the special waste building, we're seeing a lot of efficiencies with that. So part of that one year lease that Sarah had discussed gives us a chance in the spring to discuss with 
the town of Richmond upgrading and updating their site. And one of the real big conversational pieces in that in that com in in that negotiation is um, whether you know our queuing line. You know there is potential for us to add queuing line space with um, some older farm roads that are next to our property. And so we really want to hash that out. So I, I, um, it was $55,000 that we set aside for that regrind. It's, it's in Richmond under site work. Um, we're going to hold off on that this year um, until we negotiate with, and, and also to make sure that, you know, after one year, they're going to sign another lease with us. You know, there's no sense in making an investment if we tear it out of the ground. I, I, I feel relatively confident that, that we'll, we'll be at Richmond for a while. Um, but that's, those are the major ticket items there. Uh, Josh wanted to point out that in the third year out the Flint Avenue, that's the uh, crystal ball estimate of when the work would actually happen on the Flint Avenue site. Yeah, that was uh, that was in more informed. That used to be a little higher. Um, that was more informed uh, lately by our Heinsberg construction. You know, um, we saw that there were areas that we could potentially save um, in construction and, you know, looking at Flint Ave just because it's a bigger footprint. Um, it's not going to be a significant increase in cost, it will be mostly more asphalt. You know, we're not going to build a bigger tip wall. We're not going to build a bigger booth. It's just, it's a larger site. So that's why the difference between the 460 we spent at Heinsberg and the 550 at Flint Ave, it's, it's not a significant jump. But yes, that's that's our crystal ball. If, and FY23, if all, all comes to fruition, everything works the way it's supposed to, then we will, you know, with, you know, board's blessing, we'll, we'll go ahead with that. Any other questions on DOCs? Okay, moving down to the hazardous waste facility, the two big ticket items on all of that, uh, the roof as it ha at the hazardous waste facility is uh, from back when it was a biosolids facility that some of you may remember. It's old, it can stand to be replaced. So it isn't, it isn't critical, but it's getting to the point where we should, you know, shame on us if we don't replace it and something happens. So that is one if the, the, the new wave of COVID or something happens economically due to COVID, that's another one we could push a year, but if we don't have to, I don't want to. That's kind of, that's, that's not one of the high list priorities to, to push, but if you know, push comes to shove, that's the 70,000 we'll, we'll save in our capital expenses. Um, the other big ticket item is a, a new Rover, which I think we might've, yeah, and under rolling stock. Um, on the bottom there, it's an FY23. We've got that that truck as well, um, slotted to purchase, and and that is just for the straight out purchase. We will trade in the truck we have or look to sell it. So um, the net on that will be less than that amount, but that's the capital amount we're anticipating for. Any questions on the hazardous waste or the paint facility? I have a question about the roof replacement. Have mm -hmm. you set up? Um, an RFP for that? Um, we actually, uh, uh, we hired a new uh, project manager and he was there today looking at the site, looking at the roof. I have had uh, our local roof construction company out there. They, they walked it two years ago. They were up on top of it, looking at it. So we've got a pretty, you know, that 70,000 is educated. Um, we've got a pretty good idea. The difficulty is there's not a lot of large scale roof companies in Vermont. There are in New England. And to get a, a, a competitive bid, we'll probably have to expand it to New England. Um, but yeah, the, the bid the bid is, you know, we can queue that up pretty quick. Bruno, are you wondering about solar? I hadn't quite gotten there. I was thinking about um, timing and, and if the expense was reasonable um, with, within market rates. Um, and I, I was also thinking about timing. I mean, we're coming into winter, so I can't imagine that that work will be done until the snow melts at this point. Um, and so just thinking about timing was was that aspect. Um, but certainly, you know, worth talking about solar too. Um, you know, I don't I don't know that that is uh, within scope for this, but uh, those other questions were my primary questions. Barring a critical failure, this would be a springtime project. Okay. And we don't anticipate a critical failure. Um, all right, that's hazardous waste and latex. Uh, any more questions? Are there uh, 
Any changes to the inside of, the, of that building? I know we've talked about renovations from time to time, but I just don't see any, anything on the list. We, we looked at um, some significant renovations and what we actually wound up doing was moving the paint uh, program out of the building. It shared um, hazardous waste and paint were shared in there. With moving um, that paint out, uh, we found a, a warehouse that works, it suits our needs. That's way less money than the retrofit we were looking at. So that's, that's why you don't see those on that, that on there anymore. Good. All right, we'll move to the next one, which I think is a yeah, administration. Um, so we've got slotted a new server. Our existing server is five years old. Um, I won't pretend to make up anything about the server other than we need a new one. Our old one's five years old. If you, any questions, to defer to John on that. Um, but um, our, our, our network is extremely important right now. Um, and that's really the big ones there. I think we've got a phone system in FY23. Oh, and, and again, we've got some investment at our existing admin building for repaving the parking lot. And that's, you know, that's to be discussed, I think, down the road with any kind of more significant MRF talk and what we're going to do with our admin office. Um, you know, do we want to invest in that or do we want to rent or do we want to build a new one? Because um, we are running out of space. And what COVID has taught us is the things that we've been limping along really don't work that well sometimes. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we can't go back into our facility or our, our admin office for quite some time. And adding on to that too, it's not only just the space, um, we are, are maxed out or we were close to maxing out and then we um, were able to, um, some of our, our outreach staff moved their office into the um, ODF office building um, so we were able to kind of disperse a few of our folks to ease up on the crunch, but it was, you know, as Josh said, due to COVID, now we know that we really need to take seriously the, um, the air exchange uh, within that building. So we are going to continue to do some more research on um, the value of remaining there. And, you know, should we look at a rental or a lease situation um, that may already have those investments made. Because um, I, I don't think, not even I don't think, I know we wouldn't be able to retrofit that building the way um, I think people would be recommending that we would need to. So, so we'll be doing some more, more research um, on that this over the next several months. There are a bunch of firms uh, and other businesses have looked at this work at home situation and uh, are, you know, talking about needing like a third or less space than, you know, are we giving that some, some potential thought for the future? I think we'd need to. And, um, you know, if we're looking at, at leasing a space, we certainly wouldn't need to lease as large a space as we thought we did a year ago. So I think it does make it more affordable for us. Um, if we're looking at, you know, again, even if it's, it's in, maybe it's not everyone is permanently work from home, but we do have some employees who, who uh, really do prefer it and just have found they work better and, and can very easily do their work from home. So that does absolutely factor into it, Alan. And um, that's why, like I said, we'll be taking another look you know, prior to the decision in March about how long to continue to not be actively, more of us actively in the office. Um, we'll take a look at those, those needs and take a look at what may be available um, to, to rent. Um, so uh Go ahead. I was just saying, and summing it up, you know, the, the program input blue line I'm showing you is that's input from the MRF. One thing I haven't, that's not on this and will be brought to you in detail um, is our uh, third party um, agreement 
our potential agreement um, at our ODF. Um, you know, if we go down that road, which it looks like, you know, through our MOU, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of back and forth with this group. We will look to probably, um, we will have to change the ODF setup. And so for instance, the existing scale, which is slotted in there to be replaced, it's from the biosolids facility as well. So it's roughly 28 years old. We'll have to get a new scale. So there, there's gonna be some site augmentation at the ODF um, on the active kind of um, working yard area that's not in here, but that will be every step of the way brought to the board for discussion. Um, but that's just one thing I haven't shown. And that probably will show up till FY22 anyway. Um, because we'll we'll work through the negotiating piece of how that relationship will, will work out, what site augmentations we need to make, and then kind of we'll be able to put numbers to that as well. So just wanted to bring that up to the board also is that um, we do have things to, to discuss for FY22. Uh, I wanted to share that the, um, I don't know if, if uh, Leslie's on the call, but uh, we went in, at the finance committee the other week, we went into all of this in, in quite great detail and we're generally satisfied with the, what, what had been presented to us. I just want to call out to the rest of the board, again, the 740 odd thousand dollars in three years out related to refurbishing the current MRF. Um, the finance committee recognized that that really brings a lot of focus on the need for the board um, to focus on the new MRF and um, kind of make a fish or cut bait sort of decision in the next couple of years. That really rises to the top of our agenda and we all need to pay a lot of attention to that. Otherwise, we're gonna be facing a lot of significant expense that uh, potentially really won't be worth it in the long run. Thank you, Paul, you're, um, you're exactly right. And we'll be bringing more information to the board in January about that. Um, Jen and I are gonna be working more over the next, uh, through the end of the next, this current calendar year, so through the end of December on, um, uh, you know, what some of the different scenarios may be. We'll bring Josh and Noel into that as well as far as, you know, what are some of the financing options, funding grants, et cetera, so that you have a better idea of um, some of the options going forward because you're right. Yeah, I think what the board will need to know um, in order to make that Fisher you know, decision is what's it going to cost and what are we looking to ask our communities for? So we need to be bringing that information to you sooner rather than later as well. And it's, it's just also important to point out that you know we did an upgrade in 2014. We're talking FY23, FY24, that upgrade's 10 years old. So you know the, the do nothing option is going to get expensive soon because um, we do have to upgrade what we've got or at least main, you know, recondition. Sarah, sorry. Yep. Okay. Hey, Sarah, a few months ago, we looked at uh, kind of three high level options for uh, potential MRF sites, for example. Could we get something similar? And if so, in what time frame for uh, administrative, uh, least administrative space? Um, are you looking for? Just for least administrative space or for the MRF as well? No, I'm sorry. No, just just for the something similar to the MRF, but just for the I, administrative space. I'd like, you know, just so we get out some high level numbers to understand what the implications would be. Because I just, you know, the current space was was inadequate before the pandemic right. and is certainly proven to be totally inadequate now. Um, and on the flip side, I think there's going to be some, you know, some some companies that have rented space are gonna realize they no longer need it. I think we may need less space, but we absolutely positively still need space. And you know, let, maybe I think now is probably the time to move. And I would rather not see us hitch our wagon to saying, oh, we're just gonna co-locate with the MRF because then I feel like we're being painted into a corner as a board. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yes, yeah, so we can certainly do that. I think we would, uh, I will talk to um, Amy and, and Josh and Tim uh, about that, be, Tim Shea, so that we can get information to certainly to the finance committee ahead of the, or in time for the, um, the budget uh, conversations. So those start going in earnest in February. So if we can have it for you for the board in January, I think that's a good goal. That would be great. Okay, thank you, Tim. Other thoughts or questions? I had um, 
a question about our uh, IT security. And granted, we're small peanuts compared to UVM, but knowing that we're an essential service as well, just curious if there's any aspects that need to um, be factored into improving our information security and our backups. Um, John, are you able to address that? Yeah, I'm here. Um, that's one thing. Right now, we're, you know, as far as backing up our uh, data and our infrastructure, we're relying on what, what would be considered just a straight backup system. Uh, we've entertained the idea of what's called a um, disaster recovery system that would basically replicate the infrastructure we have on site, uh, typically on a, another remotely uh, located machine locally, and then a cloud-based backup. So you sort of are triple backed up, and that would be part of the somewhat higher uh, price you're seeing for a server replacement in uh, the capital budget. So that's one piece. As far as uh, network security itself, I'm pretty confident we're up to speed right now. We contract with an MSP who provides us with uh, all the network security services and um, antivirus and all the expected utilities you'd have there. Uh, as well, uh, bringing all of our facilities onto our network, um, we're securing our network from uh, having more attack surface uh, that we've had in the past. So we're eliminating some of that attack surface by bringing all of our sites onto a secure VPN. Great, glad to hear it. Um, all right, are we good on questions there? Um, I had asked Sarah to bring capital projects back in front of the full board as that's um, an evolving topic and, and really don't want too much time to go between getting updates, even if there's nothing to vote on. Um, I think the discussion goes a long way and, and uh, things change rapidly and sometimes not that quickly all at the same time, <laughs> it seems. Um, so, just want to continue to be diligent about bringing the conversation back and, and giving updates. Where are we on this, even if there's not a, a decision point? So I, I do think there was a lot of great discussion tonight and it was worthwhile, I, I think. So hopefully you felt that it was that way as well. Um, so before we move hey, on, Brandon. any other thoughts? Um, this is Alan. Uh, the only other thing that I can mention is that, you know, the Finance committee shouldn't be driving the capital budget train. The board should be. And and so, you know, I, I get a little bit concerned when all of it's been, you know, reviewed and agreed to by the finance committee before it comes to the board. So it's just my opinion. So Alan, my opinion is that we, we didn't approve it, but that we're, we're functioning really as, a, as the eyes and ears of the full board, getting into a little bit more granular detail. Um, my sense is that sometimes these things can be glossed over at a full board meeting, but certainly it's not my intent that we would do anything um, that, that usurps the full authority of, of the entire board. And I would, I would certainly oppose anything that did that um, at a finance committee meeting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for bringing that up and, and the, um, what we brought to the finance committee and to what we just reviewed right now was what was approved by the board in the budget um, in May. So it was more of a, like Brent said, an update on where we are with the projects given all the COVIDness um, and what things have we had to push, et cetera. So this was just essentially the update mid, almost midway through the fiscal year um, where we think we are gonna be as far as the spending to date, spending that we have in the pipeline and potential spending or not going forward. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Sarah, I think we are ready to move to the next topic. Um, so I believe that's the executive session. Uh, if there's nothing else to cover. Thank you, Josh. Yes, Josh, thank you. Thank you, Josh. All right, um, can I hear a motion to uh, the language read to move to executive session? 
I move that the Board of Commissioners of the Chittenden Solid Waste District go into executive session to discuss ongoing and pending litigation where premature general public knowledge would clearly place the district and its member municipalities and other public bodies or persons involved at a substantial disadvantage and to permit staff and the Solid Waste District Attorney to be present for this session. Thank you. A uh, quick moment before we vote, uh, everybody should have, all the commissioners should have a second link uh, that John sent out. Um, if you do not have that, please stay on. If you do not have that readily available, please stay on the call so that John can work with you to make sure that you get it um, to make a smooth that, transition over. The executive session came from me. So, okay. we, um, so John can um, text me if someone doesn't have it or can't use it and I will re-forward the invitation. Okay. Um, and so at this point, I will take a vote. All in favor? Well, we need to uh, move and second. Sorry, thank I'll you. I'll move it. Second. Second. Thank you. Now we're ready. Thank yeah. you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? Any object? Okay. Okay, we've officially left the executive session. Um, at this time, we would like to discuss the date for a special meeting. Uh, Sarah, if you can walk us through that. Sure, I think we would like to um, set a special meeting of the full board of commissioners. Um, I recommend uh, Tuesday, December 1st. Um, time is up to you. We normally meet as, uh, as this board at 6 p.m. I think it's fine to keep the 6 p.m. time time slot. Um, this special meeting would be an executive session as well. So it'd be um, a one topic um, I, uh, meeting and held an executive session. Are we, uh, can everybody just confirm that we'll be able, so that we know that we can have a quorum on that date? Yes. I can, I can make it. I can make it. Essex is good. Westford, yes. Richmond will be absent. Okay. Shelburne will be, be there if we want. Okay, thank you. Colchester can be there. Thank you. And I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I think we have, we'll have a quorum for that night. Um, Logan, I'm not sure if you'll have uh, an alternate available. But um, certainly we'll invite them if, uh, if you do. Yep, the meeting will be uh, publicly warned and we'll get that out to everybody. So everyone will have the date. All right. Uh, is there any other business at this time? I do not have any. All right. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. We adjourn. Okay. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Anybody object? <laughs> I didn't think you so. object. You have to stay here. <laughs> all by yourself. Anyone abstain? All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.